Now, before I get started on this segment, I got a special message for all the trolls, haters, and fuckwads that are trying to post their stupid shit on my page. You know, stuff like, oh, he's a drunk. He's a drug addict. Really? Newsflash, numb nuts. The only drugs I ever do are these. Why do I need them? Putting up with your stupid asses. Okay, on with the show, kids. At some point, Dean told Mike that he was up for a big promotion and that Mike would be taking his place as a master counselor. On the following full moon, he was initiated into his new role as the master of ritual. Perks of his new job included free rent, free groceries, a chauffeur, unlimited booze and dope, and two pretty roommates to ca who catered to his every whim. According to Warnke, these two girls were considered slaves, doing all the housework and preparing his food and drugs. At meetings, Warnke involved demons, mock disemboweled naked women on the altar, advocated blood drinking, and desecration of the Eucharist. Mike said he took sadistic pleasure in watching the female witches take their first sips of blood. From this point in his narrative, Warnke begins to hint that the fourth step in the satanic hierarchy is the Illuminati. The people at this level were well-dressed professionals, almost aristocratic in bearing. Strangely, Warnke never asked his fellow Satanists about the fourth level. He seemed content to let the upper echelons remain shrouded in mystery until he was considered worthy to join their ranks. Perhaps he was satisfied with the power he wielded? Warnke ritually summoned demons at each satanic ceremony, and the demons did his bidding. He tells us the demons are capable of possessing people and driving them to insanity and suicide. They can cause disease and impede spiritual growth. Evidently, <laughs> he hasn't uh, examined anything called uh, medical science, but I digress. One night, to impress a childhood pal who was visiting, Warnke summoned a demon and ordered it to burn down a bar. A short time later, the building was ablaze. Later, the coven cursed two young daughters of a valley college professor who had spoken dismissively of witchcraft and caused an ex-member to have a near-fatal car accident, or so he claims. Impressed with his performance as a master counselor, some force stagers sent Warnke to a gathering of high-level witches organized by one Bridget Bishop of Salem, Massachusetts, a descendant, supposedly, of the first witch executed during the Salem witch trials. Some of Bishop's descendants do still live in the area, and a decade ago, several of them called for Bridget's full exoneration. A latter Bridget was not among them. According to Warnke, the new British bishop, or Bridget Bishop was a stunningly beautiful woman who lived in a large old house stuffed with antiques. At this witch convention, the main topic was organization. Uh, according to what I've said so far, you know, they kind of need it. You know, standardized scripture, and not teaching the same theology, satanic theology and all that. Yeah. We learn that the U.S. Satanic Witch Movement has a corporate-style structure and uses tactics culled from big business and the military to keep everything running smoothly. According to other ex-Satanists, the other way around, but again, I digress. Hearing this, Warnke had his New World Order revelation. Ding! He suddenly realized that there could be a fifth stage controlling everything, not just Satanism, but world events. Here's a quote from page 93 of his book, The Satan Seller. A worldwide, super-select, super-secret control group with perhaps as few as a very dozen at the top, with key men controlling governments, economies, armies, food supplies, pulling the strings on every major international event, and not just now, but for generations, centuries, and since the beginning of civilization. Manipulating men by their egos and their appetites, rewarding and depriving, enraging and pacifying, raising up first one side and then the other, maintaining a balance of frustration, bitterness, and despair. He heard other attendees talking about the demons that had controlled the worst dictators in history, Nero, Hitler, and Stalin, among them. A light went on in his head, again, ding! 
showing him that demonically inspired Satanists and her human puppets were the force behind international finance, politics, war, industry, and everything else. Here's another quote from his book. I laughed a little hysterically, but the light show wouldn't shut off. So that was how it was done. The global conspiracy buffs were right after all. Lee Harvey Oswald, James Earl Ray, Sirhan Sirhan, they were the pawns of a much bigger plot. Keep in mind that Warren Key was supposedly having this grand revelation in between the autumn of 1965 and the summer of 1966. At that point in time, James Earl Ray and Sir Han Sir Han were basically non-entities. He also realized that he and all the other Satanists were just pawns in Satan's campaign of jealousy and hatred, and that Satan probably hated humans just as much as he despised the God who denied him his rightful place in heaven. Apparently it didn't bother him too much. He just got on with his Satanic business. He attended another witchcraft convention in New York where he learned that some Satanists were sacrificing their fingers, uh, also mentioned by Doreen Irvine, and eating human flesh. Warnke introduced both practices to his coven and added cat sacrifice to the rituals as well. He also suggested that his group collect blood from stray dogs if they couldn't get enough human volunteers, and he later learned that reports of exsanguinated dogs rose up to 500% in that area. After an occult convention in San Francisco where he supposedly met Anton LaVey, he used a new formula during a meeting and inadvertently sent a young woman into a screaming, frothing fit of demonic possession. In accordance with the, the Great Mother, <clears throat> aka the Satanic Bible, he decided it was time to start raping virgins at Sabbaths. Oh, by the way, the Satanic Bible does not advocate raping innocent people. But, continuing, he and three other Satanists convinced a college student named Mary to accompany them to the Orange Grove where they usually held their rituals, then violently forced her to disrobe and lay on the altar. <clears throat> she was supposedly raped by an unspecified number of men before being taken to a doctor affiliated with the coven, someone who wouldn't talk. Meanwhile, Warnke's speed use was spiraling out of control and he was becoming very paranoid. He feared the Mafia, Communists, and every bump in the night. The higher-ups evidently decided he was a liability, so his slave girls were instructed to give him an overdose of heroin. So while he was drifting in and out of consciousness, cult goons removed him from his apartment and dumped him on the sidewalk in front of a hospital. <clears throat> he registered as John Doe and went through agonizing withdrawal for a week. When he returned to his pad, the slave girls were gone and most of his satanic paraphernalia had been removed. He had been ejected from the Brotherhood, and he also lost his part-time job at a burger stand. With few choices left, he joined the Navy. Withdrawal made boot camp a nightmare, but the two Christian men in his unit lovingly tended to him day after day. These guys, named Bob and Bill, is it the same Dr. Bob and Bill W. from AA? <laughs> I wonder. Anyway, they seemed to be filled with a calm and peace that others lacked. One day, Warnke's eye fell on the Bible. It was open to John, and verse, chapter 3, verse 16 caught his eye. He picked up the book and began reading it in the privacy of a broom closet. He found himself unable to put it down, so he read throughout the night. By dawn, he was saved. After basic training, according to the story anyway, Warnke visited his family for the first time since he left Crestline for Valley College. While there, he ran into an old classmate named uh, Sue Studer, another born-again Christian, and they were soon engaged. He told her all about his satanic past. Both Sue and Mike claimed that Satanists were gunning for Mike at this time. Their friend Lori narrowly escaped being shot while snooping around a warehouse where the Brotherhood was gathering, and someone fired shots at Mike's car. Mike himself was a danger to those around him, Still in the grip of demons, he tried to strangle Sue one night. She realized what was happening and ordered the demons to depart in the name of Jesus, which seems kind of strange way to react to a murder attempt by your fiancé. <laughs> anyway. In 1967, the newlyweds settled in San Diego where Mike went through training to become a Navy medic. They befriended a pastor who is now a household name. 
Tim LaHaye, surprise, co-author of the Left Behind novels. When Malinke told him about the Brotherhood and their efforts to scare him, LaHaye replied, quote, I've been attacked by witches, end quote, and filled him in on the history of the Bavarian Illuminati. Every Christian who heard Mike's story was equally supportive and accepting. However, no one suggested that he turn himself into the police for abduction and rape, or drug running for that matter. No one advised him to seek psychological help or drug treatment. In fact, church members urged him to become a Sunday school teacher. That's scary. Hmm. Anyway, just as Sue learned she was pregnant, uh, Warren Key was shipped to Vietnam. In this dismal atmosphere of death and devastation, he soon reverted to drinking and popping pills. His newfound faith in Christ dwindled. Though he was not supposed to be armed, he was, and one day an officer ordered him to execute a suspected Vietnamese spy. In October of 1969, his unit was, was withdrawn. He returned to California in March of the following year. By this time, he had a three-month-old son named Brendan. Their Christian friends helped Warnke regain his footing in the faith. He began giving his testimony at Jesus People gatherings in San Diego, Coronado, and La Mesa in California. Dick Handley introduced him to Anaheim bulletin writer and photographer David Balsiger, who had become one of his uh, co-authors. Balsiger was also a media director for Morris Carullo at this time, though Warnke does not mention that. Carullo and Balsiger had constructed an educational witchmobile full of occult paraphernalia, and Carullo wanted Balsiger's help in writing a book entitled Witchcraft Never Looked Better. In the end, Balsiger and Warnke left Carullo out of their collaboration, but Balsiger did assist Carullo with his 1973 book, The Backside of Satan. <clears throat> Balsiger considered himself something of an occult expert, and Warnke donates several pages to his knowledge. Anyway, among Balsiger's pearls of wisdom, quote, we discovered that occult practitioners open themselves to mental derangement, criminal tendencies, and possible self-destruction or the destruction of other persons. Many witches say that only Satanists and black arts practitioners go off the deep end and kill people or commit other crimes, but we researched 11 recent criminal cases and occult practices were directly or indirectly linked to each case. However, <laughs> he doesn't explain who conducted this research, how it was conducted, how occultism was connected to the cases, or even which cases were examined. I guess we pretty much have, just have to take his word for it. Uh, one of his claims is uh, witchcraft is being taught as an official course or as part of a lecture series in public schools all across the country under a variety of course titles, including the literature of the supernatural. Really? In all my years in public schools, uh, I've never seen a course or lecture series like that. Have you? Okay. Probably not. Anyway, so, you know, what these people want to do. They want to ban supernatural literature from public schools? Fine. Would that list include this baby right here? There's a whole lot of supernatural stuff going on in it, too. If you're going to ban one, you might as well ban them all. Here's yet another one. 40 to 50 percent of those undergoing treatment for various neurosis in and out of mental institutions have dabbled in the occult. And it never occurs to most psychiatrists to ask about this, nor would they know how to deal with it if they did ask. You know what that means? That means at least 50 to 60 percent of people in mental institutions have not dabbled in the occult. This is simple mathematics. And yet another claim of his is uh, that the peace symbol has a satanic origin. Also, it was used in not Hitler's Nazi death notices and as part of the official inscription on the gravestones of Nazi, Nazi SS officers, the leaders of which, incidentally, were Satanists. Uh, we got... Uh, book called The Morning of the Magicians by Berger and Powell as the 
source of this factoid. And he goes on to claim, in some parts of the country, the occult epidemic is more serious than the drug abuse seen among young people. Okay. Anyway, at the urging of Balsiger and others, Warnke applied for early release from the Navy. He had four years left to serve, so he could launch an anti-occult ministry. He tries to convince us that Satanism poses a real threat to the average American. On page 195, he writes, quote, Drug pushers and political revolutionists are using devil worship as a way to rake in millions of dollars, weaken the government, and destroy law enforcement. Really? <laughs> the government <laughs> hasn't been weakened at all. In fact, it's quite the opposite. And destroy law enforcement? Jeez. We're face first in a police state. Anyway, when a reporter asked for his opinion on the Manson murders, <clears throat> he said, quote, Well, the main point here is that lots of crimes are committed as a result of occult involvement, and people should report to the police if they see someone going around wearing human bones as jewelry. That's already illegal. Or if there's a group meeting under a full moon. First Amendment right to peaceably assemble. Freedom of religion, you know. If people want to worship under a full moon, they sure as hell can. As long as they're not sacrificing humans. What Warnke advocates, basically, is a new witch hunt. He even scoffs at the notion that medieval and early modern witch hunts were nothing but mass paranoia. At a press conference, he urged people to get up tight with bookstores that sold occult literature and theaters that screen horror movies. As soon as early, his early release was granted, which Warnke portrays as a miracle, he began setting up speaking engagements to share his testimony. Morris Carullo, the preacher who got him started on his path, is not mentioned anywhere in a Satan cellar. He and Warnke had a falling out when Warnke went off on his own, and Warnke reportedly forbade Carullo from using any part of his life story in his revival sermons. Carullo did include some of Warnke's anecdotes in his 1973 book, The Backside of Satan, however, and those tidbits would come back to haunt Warnke. The, Satan, the story of the Satan Seller concludes with Mike and Sue starting on their glorious new ministry. At the end of the book is a list of suggestions for combating the occult. Write to congressmen and senators about the occult menace. Picket bookstores and movie theaters. And investigate schools to make sure they aren't teaching kids about things like supernatural literature. Again, does that supernatural literature include this? If you're going to ban one, ban them all. <laughs>